Thank you very much, uh, John, and it is uh, for me a great honor to be able to uh, participate in this session and to learn from um, these uh, very eminent uh, authorities on questions of pluralism and recognition of and uh, accommodation of diversity. Uh, the comparison that we're about to embark on is at one level um, somewhat unusual, comparing Canada and India, but on the other, at another level is uh, very appropriate uh, for um, this exercise and for the Global Center for Pluralism to undertake. Um, if we remember uh, very quickly our histories of Canada and, uh, and of India, we, we remember that they're both uh, in their uh, modern origins um, are um, ex-colonies of, um, of uh, Britain, have emerged from the British Empire. One of the advantages of that experience, there are many other issues, what we could raise about it, but one of the advantages was the um, installation of a set of um, institutions um, around uh, liberal democracy and the functioning of liberal democracy. I think this afternoon we'll hear uh, some more about those institutions. So that this, com this comparison um, of two countries with uh, institutional arrangements at one level quite similar and at another level very different um, um, is, uh, is coupled with a comparison of their experiences with deep, uh, to use uh, Charles Taylor's term, deep diversity and how over the last 50 years or so those questions, have, uh, the, que the issues raised by diversity have been addressed to the point where we can look now both at Canada and India as relative, and, and uh, I'm not uh, uh, surprising the, uh, the other two uh, participants in any sense by saying relative successes in, um, with respect to pluralism. So the first question that I'm going to ask them is in fact, a question about the reasons that they would identify or the factors that they would identify as being the underpinnings of the success first of India and then of uh, Canada. Well, <clears throat> let me begin with some of the cultural and ideological conditions that uh, help foster uh, deep religious diversity in India. One is the uh, resource that is available in Indian traditions of accepting that you can believe in one God, many gods, or no God, or that this God can take any form, human or non-human, and that all of these are acceptable and uh, whatever that ultimate good might be, uh, a belief in and a practice related to any of these uh, are equally valid routes to that ultimate good. Uh, I think that's something which has been pretty strong in India. And uh, this is not something that is shared only by those religions uh, that are believed to have been born in India, namely, you know, Hinduism or Vedism, Buddhism and Jainism and, and so on. But, but uh, even those faiths that, that came to India, uh, the Syrian Christians uh, that came in the first century, uh, a lot of the Islamic uh, believers who came in the sixth, seventh and eighth century and later uh, and uh, the, the Parsis who came from Iran, I mean, all of them in some ways uh, were participants in that culture. And uh, the nature of these faiths in India is quite different from, and this is not surprising, the nature of these faiths is quite different from the way they are uh, or they exist in, in many other parts of the world. And, and so they, 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 they acquire some of these so-called polytheistic uh, you know, within quotes features. And that is a pretty important condition for why uh, diversity can be very easily accepted. There are a couple of other things and I'll be very quick about it. Uh, one is that I, I think the, the lack of, particularly in Hinduism, but also in Islam, the lack of a centralized authority uh, in regulating uh, and controlling 
uh, you know, uh, 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 the boundaries of the religion. I think uh, that also helped in movement across uh, religions as well as in multiple allegiances. And also the, uh, a tradition where uh, religion never legitimated political rule uh, or political violence and uh, no, uh, no uh, public power uh, was aligned to any particular religion. So there was no, uh, you know, ideas like, you know, there has to be a, a strong theocratic state or, or a state with established religion. I, those are pretty much foreign to, to these Indian traditions. And I think all of this helped the growth and the, and the, and the, and the fostering of uh, religious diversity. And all this, many of the lessons of this, despite uh, a massive assault on this tradition in the 20th century, uh, and we can come to that later. Uh, I think the Indian Constitution pretty much uh, uh, it reflects uh, some of this uh, by accepting religious diversity, uh, by discouraging ethno uh, majoritarian forces, uh, by uh, uh, encouraging communitarian aspirations, but also in some ways uh, encouraging uh, uh, emancipatory urges. Uh, uh, so I think that this balancing that it does uh, is, is pretty much in tune with uh, the kind of uh, 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 philosophical and religious and other forms of diversity that exist in India. Okay, well, thank you very much. If I had to summarize this in one sentence, <laughs> uh, I would say that, that you, you're describing a situation where a, a pluralist society, a, a, with society with deep diversity, is in fact allowed to uh, um, experience pluralism in the sense of respect for that diversity in part, not exclusively, but in part because of the solid foundation of the constitutional arrangements and the things that follow from yeah. it. Okay, what about Canada? Well, I think that we lucked into our present situation, <laughs> not that it's <laughs> you know, I'm totally good, and I think you could best see it by a series of historical accidents or ironies or uh, with unsuspected consequences. I think we tend to think of diversity in Canada in three dimensions. I think we think of certainly the original relation between the settlers from Europe and the Aboriginals as one dimension of diversity, and then we've always thought of the English, French, or Quebec, rest of Canada, as another dimension of diversity, and then we've thought of the Canadian population, which has been built up by immigration from all sources, as another uh, dimension, and we usually use the word multicultural for that, that dimension. And in all of these things, it could have gone very, <laughs> very wrong, but I think it didn't for a series of reasons. I mean, take the English French, which was also Catholic Protestant at the beginning, uh, divergence, right? Well, <clears throat> when the British conquered Canada, New France, they, the normal thing was to make the Anglican Church, uh, you know, the established church, but this is a politically not very smart move, particularly when the Americans were about to rebel against the crown. So they re refrained from doing that, but at the same time, they didn't make the Catholic Church uh, established. So we lucked into, I mean this is a typical muddling through, right? We lucked into a situation in which there were no established churches in Canada. So no <coughs> fight between established churches and non established or, or etc. Yeah. And then maybe you could argue that on even on the first dimension that in relation to the Aboriginals, our record isn't all that good, but there were moments when where there were alliances way back in the under the French regime and later on in face of the American and so there were moments of first pressing in this direction. And then the third dimension is the one where there's some very shameful things in our history, like the treatment of Orientals and so on, and the uh, Japanese and Chinese in the, in, in the West. But I think that the very, the tremendous, obviously, importance of immigrant populations in English Canada, in any, in any case, made the idea unsustainable that we're all from the British Isles somehow with a few <laughs> other people who should become as much like us as, as they can. So you have, it could have gone wrong at various times, but I think there were hints and things to work on which allowed us to move into 
a society since, let's say, the 1970s, where we officially think we should celebrate diversity rather than see it as a, uh, as a danger. Now, there's all sorts of slippings away from that and so on, but I think that's become part of our, our sense of what our you know, cultural political DNA is. And there's a long history full of accidents and trippings up and so on, but <laughs> I think you can see how it somehow you know, these decisions like the decision about the Catholic Church and the French language in Quebec, which are taken for the purely instrumental reasons by the imperial power, turn out to have you know, very good positive consequences. Okay, thank you. So again, we see the, the if, if we put, I accept your point about luck, but if we also try and structure it a bit more, we see that at certain crucial moments in time, political action, political decisions, influenced by internal factors or external are very important. Which leads me then to my second question, which I'm gonna start ask uh, Charles Taylor to begin because um, he is, um, well either, I'm not sure which order they're coming in. There will be in La Presse uh, tomorrow and on Saturday um, two op-eds that are related to this, uh, this forum. And um, in uh, Charles Taylor's op-ed, he introduces um, and develops the concept of the fr fragility of pluralism and the fact that this is something that is, um, in a sense, constantly under threat. So I wonder if you could talk a bit more about this notion of the fragility of pluralism and then um, I'd link that obviously to some of the challenges that we face mm -hmm. um, here and now in uh, Canada. And I will then ask you the same question about the fragilities and patterns of, uh, and of challenge in India. Yeah. Well, I think that the main fragility comes from the nature of democracy itself, that democratic polities as against autocratic ones or authoritarian ones require a very strong bond between the citizens. They have to participate. They have to accept solidarities of various kinds, not because they're ordered to, but from their own, from their own hearts, because that's the nature of the regime. And that means that they have to have a formulation somewhere of what unites us, right? And sometimes it can be being united by an ethnic origin, you know, we're all French or we're all Danes or we're all Germans and so on, but it also is almost always in the modern world united by certain political ethic, of democracy, human rights, etc. Now, once you have that kind of definition, the, it's possible for it to slide in a direction towards exclusion. Why? Because it's possible to come to see certain elements of the population as well, not really living up to or not really part of what is, a, what is commonly agreed. I mean, just to give an example from the US election, last presidential election, unfortunate remark by Romney, maybe fortunate if you wanted him to lose, where he said, you know, 47% of the population are got really passengers and are not contributing, right? Now that is, typical remark of somebody who is sliding into his picture of what really makes Americans, that they contribute, that they're full of entrepreneurship and so on, into a reason to say these people are really not living up to it. And, and then you can have that from an ethnic point of view, because it's an ethnic definition, these outsiders, they can't really belong to us. So the very thing that holds the society together can turn toxic if you make it into a, a reason for exclusion. So in the recent debate in Quebec, we all agreed that some kind of secularism, laicite, unite us, and then suddenly we got this pointing the finger. These people are wearing this strange head, headgear for some kind of obscure, dangerous reason are a threat. They're moving us away from. And what you have underlying this is some kind of sense of, of discomfort that majorities very often have when something very new arrives, but then it gets, you see, it gets rationalized in this way which touches the common political ethic, and he uses that as a reason to, to mark these people out. Now, I think the fragility is that we're always open to this, and a new situation where, let's say, a new population comes we haven't lived with before, or a new twist in what we think is really important, 
a new situation can take the most wonderfully diverse and pluralist society and threaten it with, in face of this uh, group, turning in an exclusionary direction. So that, I mean, the lesson is, you never are, you never achieve a, a diverse, pluralist society once and for all. That's the fragility. There's always new moments in danger. Well, I think uh, I completely agree with uh, Professor Taylor, but I'd like to uh, add two more features which perhaps might be sequentially uh, prior to uh, this new dilemma arising in societies, which may be called the democratic dilemma, which you spoke about. And these two conditions are, uh, well, I believe they were both absent uh, in, 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 in the Indian subcontinent earlier, but uh, uh, both of them are not only present now, but firmly entrenched. One is the idea of, a new idea of religion, as, uh, as, as a bounded community uh, with a fixed set of doctrines uh, which is demarcated from other equally doctrinaire bounded communities uh, and which uh, are in some kind of rivalry for exclusive allegiance from individuals so that an individual can either belong to this or to that uh, but not to both. Uh, now this new idea of religion which I think is, uh, is kind of uh, uh, sharpened, if, if not exactly born, in 16th, 17th century Europe when all these battles among different uh, kind of sects or religious groups began to take place. I think that idea of religion has become globalized and, uh, and is accepted now everywhere. And to my mind, it is one of the one of the causes of uh, a whole variety of conflicts uh, between groups. In India, we call it communalism, uh, and, but, but it, it has other names in other places. So I think that's one. But then this, these kind of rigidly formed, uh, well-demarcated uh, rival communities, uh, then they, they get articulated with or aligned with uh, uh, nationalisms. And, that reinforces these divisions even further, and uh, they create uh, ethno-religious monoliths which are supposed to be locked in a permanent battle with one another. And uh, uh, if under these conditions you have uh, a representative democracy, then I think uh, the chances of uh, you know, these exclusionary bits that Professor Taylor talked about are far greater. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what has happened in India. So, so uh, unlike you know, uh, some other story which might have arisen after the 16th, 17th century with the collapse of the Mughal Empire, what you have is a story which is very similar to the kind of stories that you find elsewhere in other parts of the world, creating the same tensions, uh, the same kind of bitter conflicts, uh, and uh, the same uh, exclusionary uh, motives uh, at play uh, and uh, 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 requiring very similar solutions to the one that uh, that are uh, that are, that create uh, uh, that that bring about uh, both uh, peace and and some modicum of respect for one another and uh, and so the constitutional arrangements are building on those ancient traditions that I talked about. But by and large, they, they begin to reflect. Uh, and I'm glad that this happened. Uh, they, these are always contested, and, and we see this contest taking place all the time. So I completely, completely agree with the point about fragility that Professor Taylor mentioned, coming not only from sources which are in uh, the nature of democracy, but from other places as well. But I mean, we, I still sort of thank our stars uh, as, uh, uh, as a person from the subcontinent in India, I thank our star that we have a constitution which, which, uh, which uh, tries to keep this kind of majoritarianism at bay, not always successfully, which uh, is also sensitive to communitarian aspirations. And I think all human beings in one respect or another have those aspirations. But it also in some ways recognizes 
the, the deep urges that we have as individuals to be apart from communities and to live the way that we wish to live and all the emancipatory urges that we have uh, are, 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 are in protected uh, by individual rights. So, so we, we, we once again, and this is an old Indian tradition, of balancing things rather than prioritizing them, <laughs> saying this over that, and so that uh, this contextual balancing is something which is built into the Constitution. Uh, and the best uh, practices of the court as well as the parliament try to uh, uh, kind of uh, build on that uh, <coughs> a, a process of uh, balancing different values. And the successes uh, uh, come from, from, uh, uh, from a successful balancing of these values. And the, they, and the threats, challenges, and the failures, and there are many such failures, they come when uh, either these values are disregarded or if one of these values is made paramount uh, to the exclusion of other values. Okay, well, that's an extremely um, uh, interesting idea, which I think goes well beyond uh, Indian's habit of uh, trying to <laughs> trying to balance neither here nor there. I mean, what would you what would you see as the essential balancing mechanisms of this sort to um, to counterbalance the fragility in the Canadian situation? More concretely, well, see, I think that, yeah, I think that what has to move in to counter be a counterweight is that we have to develop in democratic societies a somewhat new understanding of what it is to have this common bond because we tend to treat it as something that was once for all defined by the founding fathers or whatever, or the revolution or the, the great loi sur la séparation de l'Église et l'État de 1905 and all that kind of stuff. Right? We, have the, we revere these founding moments and we think it's all already settled. But it isn't because the only way to avoid that becoming toxic is to be able to rethink it at any given moment. Hey, look, the way we're reading it up to now, it's in danger of producing these kind of divisions and, ex and uh, exclusions. We have to rethink what it really means. This is what the debate in France was, which unfortunately the right side lost, I mean, about the from about 2000 on, right? There was a certain notion of laicity which isn't really well founded in the 1905 law, as a matter of fact, that it became the image, right? Which means that we can't have these kids wearing headscarves and so on in school. And a lot of the debate was, what is laicité, right? And does it mean this? Yes, it means this. It's against sitting down and saying, look, we're living in a completely different world in 1905, with a different population. Let's think of what the basic value of laicite, which is not to make the state the property of any particular religion or ideology. That's what they were doing. They were fighting off a hegemonic Catholic church at that moment. That's the point. And how can people live together without this kind of a state tilted in one direction or the other? If you had thought of it in those terms, then the legislation they steadily put in since 2003-04 would not have been adopted. So there's a is a kind of gestalt shift we all have to make that people who say, this comes from the foundation, shut up. <laughs> no, that, that does all happen. Let's see in terms of the fundamental values that we want to live by, which we owe to some degree to our founding fathers. And so I mean, John A, he had all sorts of problems with whiskey and so on, but he was, you know, we still owe him a certain amount of, of uh, uh, let's say, uh, respect and so on, but the really crucial question is how do these basic values, how are they going to be lived out now? So we may have to revise some of these. And that means for some people that's very insecurisant. I mean, the, you know, the bond, the, what it means to be a Canadian, a Quebecois, that must be clear, right? That must be established in the beginning. And the answer is, well, in a way, yeah, the general spirit, but in its detail, no. Let's think again. It's that kind of an idea of what citizenship is, what citizen renewal is, that has to become part of the vernacular of every democratic society. Okay, so there, there has to be, a, a, in your terms, a constant rethinking a, and, a, and a constant understanding that s historical myths are myths. Yeah. They have re roots in reality, but they're constantly created or recreated through time. Um, and 
they also provide the foundations of important uh, institutional arrangements as well as a as, as sense of identity. So I can't stop myself from asking who is the we who is going to do this? Who are the, the political forces, the political actors? How do you organize uh, that kind of discussion and and sensibility of uh, the, the attention to mm -hmm. the um, the need for this kind of consciousness. You've had a role, and both of you have have played roles in these kind as leading intellectuals in your own societies and and crossing uh, borders. Is this the role of intellectuals? Is it the role of um, political parties? Is it the role of great leaders? We can point in a number of these cases to a single individual who had followers and who moved these things forward. Where does it come from, this oh. constant rethinking and readjustment? Yeah. All of the above. I mean, except that we, you know, yeah. if you're me or if you're him, <laughs> you think of what intellectuals can do. But, you know, if we, what, we do our job well, but there's no echo at all in the political parties, or the, then we're, we're dead ducks. But we have important role. I'm thinking once again, let's look at the French case. I say that because it had a great impact on the Quebec case, right? So we had to, I mean, I know more about French laicity and its history than 99.9% .9 of Frenchmen because you have to work this out. Well, a figure like Jean Bobéreau, you may not know him, but somebody who's written the history of French laicité, demystify all these, these ideas that were part of the Républicain uh, camp. That was a tremendously important task. Now, it didn't succeed in inflecting the direction of French politics since 2000, but it did actually help us to write our report for Quebec, and I think it's had some impact in Quebec. So everybody has to play their part in this, but there's a very important part that intellectuals have to play. They have to, we can make the kind of study, sit it down and make the kind of study that can give the basis for demystifying a lot of these Stories. Yeah, pretty much the same answer, really. It's a, this entire project is multiple agent dependent. You can't rely only on one section. You can't rely only on intellectuals. You have to have a very uh, uh, active, uh, stimulated civil society. Uh, you have to have political parties. And in, within those political parties, some people who can play the role of statespersons uh, who are not guided by, by vested interests alone. I mean, you can't expect politicians not to be guided by their own interests, but sometimes they can, can rise above their own particular interests. Again, the judiciary has to play a very important role, uh, and, and uh, you know, we expect sound judgments from them. Uh, the press has to play, a, I mean, a vibrant press is very important. And of course, alert citizenry. I mean, uh, uh, all, of, all of us are citizens, and we all have uh, some role to play. Fortunately, we have not only separate political public spheres where we're, where in we can express our views and exchange, uh, but we we have thanks to the technology that we have now, we have these uh, inter these intercommunicating uh, public spheres and also the development of larger and larger public spheres, which are which include which can include everybody, so that people everybody who is interested can potentially participate in them and and be. Uh, in, in some ways, uh, be able to contribute to making making decisions, or at least having some impact on decisions wherever they are made. So, so, uh, so, yeah. This is none of these uh, none of these uh, uh, issues can be decided by. When we talk about the state, for example, when I talk about the state, and I'm sure when Chuck talks about the state, I don't think we have only in mind, you know, state officials. Uh, taking decisions. It's a democratic state and all these parties must be involved in the final decision that is made. Regardless of whether that decision is correct or not, the, the, the procedure must, have, must be inclusive enough before the final outcome uh, of, of the deliberations which take, place in, which take place in this very mushy, messy, zigzag manner through mm -hmm. all these different publics. Okay, which brings us back then to the title of the uh, of the event of inclusive citizenship. I hope that you all feel that you have been um, called upon now to 
uh, act uh, up to your responsibilities for thinking and rethinking these issues. But before I turn to you, I'm going to ask each um, um, to answer one more question, um, which is that if you had to say to uh, Charles Taylor, the one lesson I have from India that might be useful to Canada is, and then if Charles had to say to you what the one lesson that Canada, I have from Canada that might be useful to India is, what would your answer well, be? Charles Taylor has already <laughs> absorbed that lesson <laughs> from India. So I, I don't say to him, but I'll nonetheless say to uh, everybody, I think the, the model of secularism, uh, you know, uh, if, a, if a lot of people think that secularism is anti-religious, uh, and uh, I think that is uh, mistaken. Uh, for lots of reasons, but one simple empirical fact is that three fourths of the world uh, is is uh, you know has uh, some religion or the other. I mean, maybe that's an understatement. Maybe five sixths of the world has some religion or the other. So if we're really going to talk about including all of them, then we can't have a we can't have a model of secularism which is anti-religious. The only model worth uh, having is one which gives uh, equal respect to believers and unbelievers, and to different times of, different types of believers and unbelievers. I mean, uh, India has had a long tradition both of fiercely, uh, you know, f very robust uh, uh, non-believers, as well as, you know, people who have uh, faith in the traditional sense of faith. And, and, uh, and, and I'm pretty certain that other cultures and other civilizations have also had that. But you really need to work out a secular uh, idea of the secular, which gives equal recognition to everybody and provides some kind of a, a, a common uh, kind of a, a arena where they can coexist uh, and, and, and not coexist passively, but actively mutually learning from each other and constantly evolving newer and newer levels of, I won't call them higher, but newer and newer levels of of commonalities uh, with giving space to uh, those differences which are, which shouldn't be, not just aren't, you can't eradicate them, but should be eradicated because that's, that's human life is uh, 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 fatally diverse. I mean, there is it's an inescapability about it and to try and eradicate those differences is as foolish and uh, dystopic as, as 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 uh, as, uh, hope, as saying that there are no commonalities that, uh, whatsoever, so somehow bringing them together once again the idea of balancing bring them together uh, at different levels or uh, at the same level but in a very dexterous and deft manner, that's a challenge that everybody has to face. In yeah, I agree with that, but I add one more footnote. They put it <laughs> another point of view that a lot of people think, and in India there's a lot of intellectuals who think. Well, secularism is already something established in the French Revolution, it's, mm. it's up there. See, it's the same kind of idea as a lot of people in France and Quebec thought, L'ACT is established somewhere up there, it's already defined. And they would be surprised to know that. We, we too, have been discussing for a number of years together with another whole group of international people, just precisely trying to redefine what secularism means, right, for our day. And in what's come up, just as much a contribution from India as uh, in its history as it has been from French history or British history or German history or whatever. So it's not something up there, some ideal type that's been established in 1789 or something. It's mm. something still being worked out. Yeah. And in the working out has been just as much contributed to by Indian intellectuals as by, by others. That's that, new. That, that's, I mean, that's new, yeah, yes. And that's something that a lot of Indian Or the recognition of that is new. Yeah, a lot of Indian intellectuals aren't aware of that, just as a lot of Quebec intellectuals aren't aware of that. But do you have a lesson? A, for, for a lesson for lesson Canada, for, for India? What's that? Yeah. Lesson for India. Well, the lesson for the, I was thinking of the lesson for those Indian intellectuals that I've met that have this fixed idea, you know, uh, some of them Marxists, some of them others, that you know, religion has to be 
pushed out of the way, and this is something that's that we've learned learning. from John Stuart Mill and, or whatever, or Karl Marx, right, and that's it, they would be, they would be maybe shaken a little bit if they thought, no, on the contrary, that what's now circulating internationally as theories of secularism and life today is something that is constantly, A, constantly being worked out, B, to which Indians have made a contribution <laughs> by trying to rethink their own version of secularism. I, I have a lesson from Canada okay, for India. thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and, and one effective rule of law uh, and basic protection of basic human rights. All those lofty things are very important and we live you know, in a diverse country, recognizing difference and so on. But when it comes to some very elementary things, we fail. And I think, uh, I, 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 I generally think that people in Canada don't fail. And, and that's a lesson that, that I think Chuck should have given me and I'm very happy to take. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so then if we would say that inclusive citizenship in the sense that we've been talking about it um, stands upon a very uh, basic set of, um, of where a basic recognition both of the rule of law and then of, of um, basic human rights as defined among other places by the, uh, the international declarations, and, but they have to be taken up by the country and, and then installed through the, uh, through the uh, actions of the judiciary. I was particularly struck by your mention of the courts because it's uh, something which we know has been crucial for the, um, for the way that pluralism has been worked out in Canada and, uh, and yet sometimes it's not uh, brought to the fore as much as uh, other factors. Anyway, 